All right, hello from the National Council for History Education. I'm Grace Leatherman, I'm the Executive Director of NCHE. We're here to wish you a very happy holiday season and we're so pleased that Joanne Freeman is able to join us to send a special message to you this time of year. Thank you, Joanne. Okay, thank you, Grace. And I'm gonna take it away. Um, I will start by apologizing, although it's not really my fault for my sort of weird paleness. <laughs> I have no idea why this is happening, but I'm actually healthy and fine. So just wanted to reassure you. Um, as always, I pondered a lot trying to figure out what to do with this special episode of, of History Matters. And so does coffee. Um, and I knew that it had to be Christmas-ish, um, and yet it had to be history-y uh, in some way. Um, and it had to have something to say, but it had to be entertaining. And um, maybe it didn't have to be all of those things, but I wanted it to be all of those things. So I went on a little research expedition for you. Um, and what I came away with was a collection of random things that the founding folk and those around them were doing Christmas time. Um, and some of them uh, are amusing, some of them are humdrum, some of them are really not amusing. Um, but for that very reason, in one way or another, they do kind of a wonderful job of um, giving a sense of the everydayness, the, the normality of life in any period of time, people dealing with the passage of time, and in this case, dealing with a holiday, uh, which was a holiday, and they did exchange presents back in the day. Um, so in a sense, I'm, I'm getting at the humanity, uh, meaning humanness of um, some of the people who we talk about during the year, and the, the folks we kind of put on a pedestal and brand them founders. Um, they're going to be pretty average people here. And um, very much uh, living in the time that they are in for better and worse. Um, so I'm, they're basically in a, um, chronological order. Uh, they are random uh, with one exception that's not in chronological order and you'll hear why at the end. But um, I'm going to start uh, with the first one that I found actually that was worth noting. And this is from George Washington. And he's writing to Colonel Joseph Reed on December 23rd, which actually is today. Okay, excellent, 1776. And uh, here's what he writes. Dear sir, the bearer is sent down to know whether your plan was attempted last night. And if not, to inform you that Christmas day at night, one hour before day is the time fixed upon for our attempt on Trenton. For heaven's sake, keep this to yourself as the discovery of it may prove fatal to us. Okay, this is Washington saying, we're going to surprise attack Trenton, and these are the Hessians at Trenton, and the colonial troops have a victory because it's Christmas, and they have a surprise attack. So lo and behold, that's the first instance I found of Christmas in my digging around and finding things is, hey, we're going to launch an attack during the Revolutionary War. Random, and yet logical why it happened on that day. Okay, um, the next one, two years later, we're still in the revolution. This one is from Edward Rutledge, South Carolina. Um, and he's writing from South Carolina to John Jay of New York. And he writes, uh, my dear Jay, actually this is December 25th. So this is on Christmas day. My dear Jay, it is a long time since we have had any correspondence but I, saw, I see no reason why it should be longer when we have anything to say and leisure to say it in. Such is my situation for it is Christmas day and all the world, parentheses, i.e. my clients, being either at their devotion or their amusements, I have time to tell you that I fear, and with some reason, that a damned infamous, infamous cabal is forming against our commander in chief, and that whenever they shall find themselves strong enough, they will strike an important blow. I give you this hint that you may be on your guard. Okay. Hey, Merry Christmas, Jay. I'm dropping you a line because I have some time because my clients are all busy. And by the way, there's a cabal brewing in the army and they're trying to overturn uh, Washington's command and take over. See ya. <laughs> so that was just, the, the tone of that was quirky. Um, and yet again, sort of December 25th, 1778, an important fact coming along on Christmas day. I don't 
I guess maybe he was right. The only reason he chose this time to do it was because all of his clients were busy. I don't know. Okay. This one is, uh, initially, I thought I was going to be talking to you all about George Washington, and be assured I will not. But the, um, initially, I was finding, oddly enough, a lot of discussion of Christmas from George Washington, which I did not expect. And um, this particular one just had a statement in it, which is crying out for History Matters, and so does Coffee, and you'll hear why. This is from George Washington to David Humphreys, who is someone who acted as a kind of secretary for Washington. And this is December 26th. 1786. So he's, he, it's a long letter and he's very sad that David Humphreys can't be with him on Christmas. Uh, and he says, I, he laments it to use his word because his absence has quote, deprived us of your aid in the attack of Christmas pies. <laughs> we had one yesterday on which all the company and pretty numerous they were we're hardly able to make an impression. Okay, I, I saw a tack of Christmas pies. <laughs> just, that just made me stupidly happy. So you might not be laughing out there, but uh, this I do all the time to my lecture courses on Zoom is I amuse myself wildly and then I pray. <laughs> Someone on the other end is laughing. The attack of the Christmas pies. That's just something a commander in chief would say, even though that's 1786. Amusingly, David Humphreys the next year is planning on being with Washington and he says he hopes to do ample justice to the Christmas pie. So he remembered, which I thought was impressive for David Humphreys. Okay, now we get John Adams. And this is December 25th, Christmas day, 1787. Um, and I mentioned this partly, as you'll hear, there's um, nothing extraordinary here. There's not a battle. There's not a cabal to oust the commander in chief of the army. Um, and there's not an attack of Christmas pies. It's John Adams being John Adams. Uh, so this is a diary entry from John Adams on Christmas Day, 1787. He writes, Christmas Day, Parson Bass preached a sermon, but I did not go to hear him. And then there's a little bit more. And then at the end, he says, I suspect I shall soon drop this journal. <laughs> so that's Adams is like, well, I didn't go to hear the preacher preaches thing on Christmas day. He mentions a few other things he did. He met someone, he had lunch with someone. He has his normal diary entry. And then at the bottom, all by itself, he says, I suspect I shall soon drop this. <laughs> Which is just so John Adams-y. Um, very human John Adams, who's very willing to be self-degradating in a certain way. And um, certainly does not treat himself like a founder, all capital letters. Okay, this is a letter to Thomas Jefferson in 1791, very early 1791, so just after Christmas, from his daughter, one of his daughters. And she writes, she writes a long letter, kind of a, hey, how are you doing, kind of a letter. And in the middle of it, actually, this is not the, this is at the very end, somehow she starts summing up Christmas gifts. She says, last Christmas, I gave sister the Tales of the Castle, which apparently is a kind of lesson slash moral book. And she made me a present of the Observer, similar kind of book, a little ivory box and one of her drawings. And to Ginny, she gave Paradise Lost. There's a heavy Christmas gift and some other things. Adieu, dear Papa, I am your affectionate daughter, Maria Jefferson. So I just thought that was actually kind of sweet. Uh, and they're giving books in the Jefferson household, which makes perfect sense. Okay, now we're moving from the sweet and amusing to the not sweet and amusing, um, but important because this is smack in the middle of everything. This is from George Washington's sister to George Washington. And this is at the beginning of 1794. She says, my dear brother, I wish you to give Howell some advice how to proceed in regard to two Negroes that run away from me a few days before Christmas, two of the principal hands on the plantation I expect their intention is to get to Philadelphia as they have a thought in getting there, they will be free. That was a slap in the face. Um, it shouldn't have been, right? This, is, this, is, this period in many ways is defined by slavery, people ignoring it, people banking on it in every way you can imagine, um, enslaved people doing the building and the making and the shaping. Um, slavery is everywhere. Uh, and I didn't have any preconceived notions about what I would find in digging around for mentions of Christmas. I should have expected something. 
um, I didn't. And so when I went from, you know, musing to this, which is two people who run away from the plantation and assuming as George Washington's sister, um, that they were, are aiming to go to Philadelphia and trying to gain freedom. That's a different kind of serious Christmas. And it makes sense that, you know, probably near Christmas would have been a good time to do that with everything in an opera. Or maybe people assumed, enslaved people assumed they might have a chance in the, in the tangle of things of getting away. I don't know. That's a different kind of important Christmas. I'm sorry to say that I do not have, I don't know what happened to those people. I, did, I didn't look it up. And even if I did, it's, it's Betty Washington Lewis. So I would have to track her down in some way. But um, anyway, I think that's, that's an important qualifier to put in here. And that's a Christmas thing too. Okay, this is actually a letter to Alexander Hamilton, December 31st, 1800. And if you think 1800, you got to think election, right? The election that starts out with Adams versus Jefferson and boils down to Jefferson versus Burr because of a tie. So McHenry is a really good friend of Hamilton's. They served together during the revolution in Washington's family. They were both aides um, and they remain friends forever. And so McHenry is writing to Hamilton from Baltimore. He says, some of our Federalists who have been here on a Christmas visit seemed inclined, if not determined, to run Mr. Burr notwithstanding his letter to General Smith. So apparently he had written a letter saying he wasn't gonna do anything untoward, you know, he was, he was gonna be good. Um, they hope by the attempt, should it even fail of success, to plant the seeds of disunion between him and his party, and should it succeed to get in him a man who will not suffer the executive power to be frittered into insignificance, which clearly is what I think of Jefferson. Um, he then goes on to say, um, we undoubtedly are threatened with a change in some most essential points in government and our national affairs, but who will venture to say that equal evils did not await us had Mr. Adams been elected? That, that also was a striking thing in which these two Federalists are, they go back and forth uh, at this period in time talking of course about Aaron Burr and it makes sense that Hamilton was thinking about Aaron Burr and getting letters about Aaron Burr in this moment. Um, and that what these Federalists are thinking is there's going to be some big changes. Uh, I don't know what they're going to be. There could have been bad changes with Adams, but we now know there are going to be some questionable changes here. Um, I don't know if anyone's playing bingo, but if you are, contingency, pointing to contingency, right? It's basically what he's saying. Something's going to happen. We don't know what it is, but it, it might be a really big change. Another random Christmas thing. Apparently, on Christmas Eve in 1807, Thomas Jefferson began suffering from a toothache. And although he did not lose the tooth, he was confined to his house for at least six weeks, six weeks. So he didn't lose the tooth, the tooth wasn't pulled. He was just in pain with a toothache for six weeks. I have no idea what happened there. Uh, physiologically, I don't know what happened to that toothache or the tooth, um, however, there's a Jefferson Christmas for you. Dang. Uh, okay, this is kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum when we're talking about the tone of things. Um, uh, this is a letter from Thomas Jefferson to John Wales Epps, uh, 1809, Christmas Day, 1809. Um, and Jefferson, for a time, uh, had his grandson in his house in Monticello. Um, the mother had died, the father was traveling, and so Francis, the, the grandson, was in Monticello and apparently really was there uh, in December of 1809. This is what Jefferson writes. Francis continues in perfect health and spirits. He is at this moment running about with his cousins bawling, a Merry Christmas, a Christmas gift, etc. He began a letter to you two days ago and had got through the second line when someone scribbled on the paper and spoiled it. I love that. It's two or three sentences. I love it because it's his grandson running around the house yelling, it's basically, it's Christmas time, it's Christmas time. And the, the sort of chaos of the household, a grandchild and, you know, seeing these people interacting with children is rare, few and far between. So I just like that because that felt sort of festive, chaotic holiday season-ish to me. 
on the opposite end of the festive holiday season-ish, we have a letter from John Quincy Adams to Abigail Smith Adams, December 30th, 1813. John Quincy Adams writes, Charles, his son, is at a boarding school where he learns chiefly to write. He comes home on Saturdays and stays until Monday. There is a Christmas vacation to commence next week and which lasts a month. In that interval, I must again be myself, his schoolmaster. So Christmas break for Charles Adams is more school. <laughs> this time with his father instead of with a schoolmaster. It tells you a lot about the Adams household, I think, particularly the John Quincy Adams household. Okay, two more, two little ones left. One of them, I, I believe I mentioned last year, but I, I couldn't leave it out. Um, and it was a report on the University of Virginia um, in July of 1828, talking about December of 1827. Uh, and what it says is the fortnight's recess for all the schools provided for the Christmas holidays, having proved injurious in practice, has been discontinued and the annual vacation fixed from the 20th of July to the 10th of September, the time for the public examination being referred to the faculty, blah, blah, blah. So basically, and I remember talking about this probably last year, um, it is unclear what injurious, <laughs> how injurious the Christmas holidays were, that recess. Injurious could have been students going bonkers, injurious could have been chaos and people leaving campus and coming back, I have no idea. But basically UVA canceled Christmas vacation in 1828. Okay, this is the last one. It's not in chronological order. I put it here because um, it's, it's sweet. Uh, it, again, it shows a father or grandfather founder folk. Um, and for, for anyone out there who has seen and liked the Hamilton musical, this will resonate. Okay, so this is Hamilton to his son, Philip, his oldest son, Philip, December 5th, 1791. You remember that I engaged to send for you next Saturday, and I will do it unless you request me to put it off. So he's away at school, Philip is away at school. So Hamilton promised that he would come and get him unless you wanted me to put it off. And he goes on, for a promise must never be broken. And I will never make you one, which I will not fulfill as far as I am able. But it has occurred to me that the Christmas holidays are near at hand. And I suppose your school will then break up for some days and give you an opportunity of coming to stay with us for a longer time than if you should come on Saturday. Will it not be best for you therefore to put off your journey till the holidays? But determine as you like best and let me know what will be most pleasing to you. A good night to my darling son, adieu. That's very sweet and somewhat sad, I realize, because um, Philip Hamilton is indeed the oldest son um, who 10 years later is killed in a duel. A good night to my darling son is very sweet. But what I like about that is it's just Hamilton being a father. I promised you I'd come get you this Saturday. I will still do it if you want me to, but you know what? <laughs> Christmas break is coming. Maybe we go wait till then, you know, maybe it would make more sense. Um, that's, that's my weird and random collection of Christmas moments in the early part of the early Republic. And I suppose the middle-ish part of the American revolution. As I said at the outset, I think that weird mix of things is kind of a reminder of the, the lives that people are living and um, the human experience at that time for better and worse, for good and bad. Uh, and some of the ways in which, although the past is indeed, uh, as the saying goes, a foreign country, um, it, it also has people in it. And it's, it's the idea of historic empathy, not necessarily un thinking I can absolutely know what it means to look through someone else's eyes, but the, the idea of using the tool of empathy to try and piece together what someone else might have been experiencing in the past, historically contextualized, but still using empathy to get at history. I think that's important. I think most historians uh, who apply their craft, they do use basic human empathy to try and understand the past. Um, I mentioned that today as Christmas approaches, I hope that you will be all, a big chunk of the History Matters community will be watching this. Um, and I send you all of my empathy uh, for whatever you're doing or however you're doing or how, whatever you're doing for the Christmas holidays, because I know everyone's 
holidays are weird this year. I had to cancel my plans. I'm hanging out with Newbie, who I hope you've been hearing him peep happily. He's been peeping for most of the time. I can hear Carolee, someone else got bingo, I know, uh, saying mug, mug, mug. And I do have an appropriate mug, although um, hopefully you won't be disappointed in it, but it's, it's linked with my particular Christmas. My mug is blank. And the reason it's blank is because I have no idea what you guys are all <laughs> doing for Christmas. I thought I'd be doing something entirely different for Christmas. And lo and behold, poof, my plans changed. So the blankness of the mug is whatever you're doing, even if you didn't get to do what you wanted to do, even if suddenly you're doing something you didn't imagine that you would be doing and you're not happy about it, have a wonderful holiday. Be with some of the people you care about. Talk to them on the phone. And remember that history matters. History does matter. And Joanne, thank you for reminding us of the humanity of our historical actors. It's it's a fascinating reminder. And 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 thank you for making the time to be with everyone during this interesting holiday. It's very kind of you. And I know everyone's we glad to hear episode. We could not miss an episode. And and I don't know. This is like 98, 99, 100. I don't know. If it's 100, I'm gonna feel really stupid for missing that. <laughs> this might be 90. 90? Okay. Because yeah. 100, we're gonna have to do something for. So maybe yeah. this is 90. At any rate, um, Pleasure to be here, Grace. Nice to see you as well. And everybody, I hope you do have a wonderful holiday. Yes, and a very happy holiday from all of us here at NCHE. And we will see you. Um, I think we will have a, a, a New Year's uh, taped recording, right, Joanne? There will be a special New Year's episode. So you're going to want to come back on the next Friday to see the special New Year's episode with me and newbie contributing to your holiday. All right. We'll have a very happy holiday until then. We'll see you next week. Happy holidays, everyone.